story. I'm being joined live now via Skype with our person who's, you know, who's who works with the Voice of America. He's a correspondent there, and he's going to be giving us the details about the situation there. Our thank you so much for speaking with us on the world today. Now, Al, I just want to ask you right now, the Russian Prime Minister has not hidden his feelings concerning the situation in Ukraine at the moment. He says that the new authorities seem to be in line, seem to be, you know, they're not, they seem, seem to be legitimate. And this seems to complement what Yanukovych said on Saturday, saying that it, what is going on right now is nothing short of a coup plot. What I'd like to ask you right now is, the events which are taking place in Ukraine now, are they actually legal? some people about that today. The president, Yanukovych, agreed to restore the 2004 constitution, which apparently gives the parliament the power to oust him, which they then did. Uh, there is some question about exactly the correct procedures, the correct uh, powers of the parliament, the correct sequence of events. But I think uh, what's important here is the fact, which is that the police and the army are being uh, loyal and obedient to the new interim authorities. So if they made some legal mistakes, I'm sure they will correct them uh, down the road in a legalistic way. Um, it's, uh, it's been accepted by the West, as you say, rejected by Russia for strategic reasons, but nevertheless, it is the fact. Now, uh, um, the asking of President Yanukovych, can we really say that this is what the majority of Ukraine wants, especially when we see that the country is divided, that the eastern part is in favor of Russia, they're pro-Russian, while the West is pro-EU. So does this move, the asking of the president, does it necessarily represent what the majority of Ukrainians want? Well, I have to say that's another excellent question, and of course there's no way to know that. There's no instant poll that, that has been taken. What I can tell you is that members of the President's party who were elected to the Parliament essentially defected to the opposition. So they are the elected representatives of the people, but they themselves have changed their political allegiance. So the question of whether the majority of voters really support this will not be answered until we get to May 25th when we have the new presidential election. And if Yanukovych's allies run a candidate, then we'll see how he or she does in, in the election. Uh, I, I think in a general sense, however, it, if you look at the really hardcore supporters of Yanukovych, I suppose you could say that a majority do not fall into that camp. So you may have some people who are more sympathetic towards him, but maybe accept his departure, and then maybe a smaller group that's really hardcore supporters. But it's very hard to pin down numbers here on two days after he left. So how much exactly could Ukraine lose financially, especially now that Russia is far from pleased? And, you know, they pledged about $15 billion in aid, if I remember correctly, and they've already given $3 billion. And based on their current displeasure, they might not even go ahead to, um, you know, submit the remainder of the aid that was supposed to be given to Ukraine. So based on this displeasure, how much could Ukraine lose financially? And is it just a case of, you know, the EU might just fill the shoes in which fill the shoes which the um, which Russia has left open. Yes, I think that's exactly right. Uh, there are billions of dollars at stake. Uh, the financial stability of Ukraine is at stake, and long term, its economic uh, future, its growth, its pr prosperity are at stake. But I do think that the IMF and the EU and uh, perhaps the United States and others will step in uh, and make sure that Ukraine remains solvent, at least during this period. And then once there is a new president and a new government uh, after May, the European Union says they'll be happy to restart negotiations on the trade and investment deal uh, that Yanukovych at first, it seemed he would sign, then he decided not to, and that's what started the crisis here 
last November. So uh, there is a lot at stake. Uh, and as far as whether the Russians will uh, give the next three billion, they said they haven't decided yet, as we've talked about before, they've made a lot of harsh comments about the new government. But they also have to keep in mind two things. One is that Russian banks have a lot of exposure, and if there are financial problems here, it's Russian banks that will suffer among the most of any banks. And the other thing is that if the Russian government accepts that they are, quote-unquote, losing Ukraine politically, uh, it will never be the same, perhaps, as it was before. It'll be closer to the West. They have to ask themselves if they want to lose it completely, or if they want to try to maintain some sort of relationship, some sort of friendship with Ukraine. And if they do, then providing some money during this interim period, as well as long term, would be a way to do that. Well, Al, it's certainly been a pleasure speaking with you. I've been speaking to Al Pesson. He is a, a correspondent for The Voice of America and he's been clarifying issues about what's going on now in Ukraine. Thank you so much, Al. We've been speaking to him there.